Hey there everyone, this is Craig from Acid Horizon, and today, once again, I would like to talk about the work of George Bataille, particularly his essay, The Labyrinth, that is found in this collection of essays, Visions of Excess, which is put out by the University of Minnesota Press. This essay was written in 1936. But before we talk about Bataille, this particular essay gives us an important opportunity to talk about one of Bataille's mentors his teacher, philosopher Lev Shestov. Following Nietzsche, both Shestov and Bataille develop a line of thought based on the image of the labyrinth from Greek myth. You know, the one that I'm talking about with King Minos of Crete and the creature at the center of the labyrinth, the Minotaur. Shestov was an emigre from Russia who settled in France, and most of his work was written around the turn of the 20th century. And one of his most renowned texts is a collection of essays and aphorisms entitled All Things Are Possible, which was written in 1905, but published in English in 1920. A dominant theme in Shevstov's work is the critique of the image of thought produced by philosophy in the West. And that is a conception of philosophy as an activity designed to produce systems of logical thinking. Shevstov targets logic and reason as the grounding force which is antithetical to the notion of philosophy that he puts forward. Now, this may seem counterintuitive at first, but let's unpack his view. Because ultimately, what's at stake for Shestov and Bataille is reclaiming these aspects of our lives that have been cut off by the primacy of reason. Now, as I said, Shestov contested the centrality of logic as a way to render the entirety of our experience and the world into the discourse of rationality. For Shestov, metaphysical systems are always gappy, they're always porous, something's always kind of leaking out of them, which means there's a fundamental incoherence to all of them. And it also means that some part of our experience is either forgotten, relegated, or banished by the system. Shestov was interested in rupturing the continuity of our logical systems in a way that would bring forth the power of the human imagination. To put it in Shestov's own words, he said the role of philosophy was to bring humanity out onto the shoreless sea of human imagination. By doing so, he puts into question the nature of thought, asking this question, what is it to think, really to think? Surely this means a relinquishing of logic. It means living a new life. It means a permanent sacrifice of the dearest habits, tastes, attachments, without even the assurance that the sacrifice will bring any compensation. A thinking person is one who has lost their balance. And in the vulgar, not in the tragic sense, hands raking the air, feet flying, face scared and bewildered, they are a character of helplessness and pitiable perplexity. One of the things that stands out to me in Shestov's attack on logic is this notion of sacrifice. The capacity to embody new ways of perceiving, thinking, acting, derive first from frustrating those habits of mind that make recourse to familiar ways of framing our world. To illustrate this idea, Shestov draws on the metaphor of the labyrinth and the minotaur. In the traditional myth, we know that Theseus enters into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur, but with the help of Ariadne and her thread, which he carries through the labyrinth so that after the deed has been done, he can follow the thread back out and make it safely back home. However, Shestov likens our adherence to logic as a kind of heroism of the ego. Once the hero affixes themselves to the certainties of logic, they become haunted by the fallacies of judgment. They also become haunted by the notion of groundlessness and this notion of progress that we all have. And also they become haunted by the creativity that has been suppressed by reason. For these reasons, Shestov enjoins us to lose Ariadne's thread and in the manner of Nietzsche, enter the labyrinth with no exit. Now, this is where Bataille comes in. There is a through line from Shestov's image of the labyrinth to Bataille's own image of the labyrinth that's articulated in Bataille's work as the principle of insufficiency. And going forward, that will be the dominant concept that I will talk about. Like Shestov, Bataille refused an image of thought bound to the idea of systemic closure. He was wary of systems that purported to have philosophical or metaphysical completeness to them. Moreover, Bataille, like Nietzsche, lambasted this tendency in philosophy to reduce our experience or our knowledge to very narrow domains such as mathematics, law, 
or something like brain function, for example. Bataille believed that this kind of narrow-mindedness was a mutilation of life and the possibilities that it could truly engender. For Bataille, our attachment to forms of knowledge belie the very varied and diffuse way that our life actually manifests. So in short, for Bataille, all being is insufficient on the basis that no life is ever complete. The lives of things are marked by their intensity. All things living go through moments of strength and weakness. And moreover, all living things contend with these opposing tendencies that are inherent to them. Bataille uses the term ipse, or ipseity in this text, to build his concept of particularity, a term often simply defined as individual identity. And while ipseity might be a reduction to the individual for some philosophers, it is important to consider the peculiarities that Bataille ascribes to his notion of ipseity, so that we don't get caught up in familiar presuppositions about individuality. So once again, first and foremost, to be ipse is to confront this insufficiency of being. Now, I've always been told that when a philosopher gives you an example to illustrate their concept, you hold on to it for dear life. And Bataille gives us this kind of crude example of how our realization of our own insufficiency plays out in the real world. Imagine those moments when you find yourself staring at a crowd of people, for example. You may be looking at them consciously or unconsciously, but perhaps there are moments in which everybody else seems other to you. And perhaps this just occurs as a full-blown negative judgment. But maybe it's simply a matter of approaching the question, why do people carry on this way? And, and what does all this mean, this life? Of course, this moment engenders a projection of our own insecurities as individuals or as particularities. Who amongst us hasn't struggled with their own sense of worthiness or stability or sufficiency for that matter? In our pursuit for a meaningful life, we are marked by a hunger for solidity. For Bataille, however, this search always runs up against a certain impasse, our terminal insufficiency, especially as we cling to things such as God or gods or even reason. Our insistence on stability is troubled by the transience of being. Put another way, our desire for the stable ground of being is always undermined by the coming to pass of what we perceive as that ground. So we might say that in Bataille's labyrinth, the thread of Ariadne is always already broken. The lives of everything suffer a constant slippage of Ariadne's thread from their grasp. Now what Bataille articulates here, of course, has some serious ethical and political implications. And it also appears in other places in his work, especially as he develops other concepts, like his concept of communication or his concept of inner experience. But to put a finer point on what Bataille means by the labyrinth, let's turn to his most prominent example, which is language. Language comprises a set of complex contingencies. For example, redundant vocabulary, grammar, syntax, structure, and so forth. And when we use language, we try to do things like define or express a contingent state of affairs, or we try to express our own radical particularity. And despite the eminent usefulness of language, language too is also porous. It is also gappy. There is a way in which language cannot represent the fullness, the complexity, and the nuance of everything that exists. It only can get these snapshots. However, we are born into language. We are, we're practically immersed in it. And that means that our way of relating to the world is forever mediated by it. Bataille writes that our being in relation to the world through the artifice of language is what proves the impossibility of us ever realizing any kind of autonomous being. We are abandoned to the medium of language, a medium which we can never gain full mastery over. Why? Because we cannot assert our autonomy over it. But for Bataille, our frustration and our inability to overcome this tenuous set of relations is actually what brings about the effect of feeling like an individual, of feeling like you could have autonomy in this world, as paradoxical as that may seem. And it's this illusory sense of autonomy that has its flip side, this feeling of being lost, of being abandoned. So for Bataille, the labyrinth isn't something that we even actually enter as it's so pervasive in our experience. And certainly there is no exiting it except when we die. And maybe that's not even the case, I don't know. Nonetheless, it's this milieu of relatedness from which we cannot extricate ourselves and in which we always feel, to some extent, ungrounded. Philosopher Benjamin Noy sums it up very nicely. 
The labyrinth is not an external structure imposed on existence, which would suppose that we could find in the labyrinth a model that could master this situation. Instead, the labyrinth is the dispersal of this being in relation, no longer on the model of a maze that always has a potential solution, but now a space of relation that lacks any solution and any sufficient moment that would secure closure. Perhaps a remaining ethical or political question is why this illusion of stability or solidity persists or is propagated despite the fact that we maintain a sense of pervasive instability, that things are always coming to pass. The collective strategy by which we oppose or counter this tendency is through the construction of what Bataille calls relatively stable holes. Relatively stable holes can take the form of things like a god or gods, a city or empires. Particular beings aggregate and then they gravitate to these figures of these relatively stable holes as a way to offset their anxiety, to quell this sense of diffusion that they feel within the labyrinth. However, when lives become the organs of these relatively stable holes, in a way they become an object of sacrifice. For example, a deity demands fealty from its loyal subjects, and the capitalist milieu demands the blood, sweat, and tears of workers, and so on. Bataille writes that the universal God destroys rather than supports the human aggregates that raise his ghost. And despite the attempt to maintain these relatively stable holes, there's always cracks in the edifice. Something is always breaking down. The lives of things, inasmuch as they are subjugated by these purveyors of stability, something always breaks through. That sense of insufficiency, the principle of insufficiency, always comes back through waves of loss and waves of regeneration and so on. So in short, to live within this labyrinth is to contend with the instability of life, but it is also to contend and be ensconced within the liveliness of things that are alive. So in the end, Bataille leaves us with a kind of question. How do we live in a world that's fundamentally disorienting? How do we live in a world where the dominant modes of trying to orient things always allow that principle of insufficiency to come back in? Well, he has some answers for this in the remainder of the essay, which I believe you should check out. However, in the meantime, I invite you to join our Patreon account on Asset Horizon. Currently, we have two reading groups going. We currently have a reading group reading A Thousand Plateaus. And also, we have a Bataille reading group that is working its way up to reading the Accursed Share series. Also, there are other ways to support us. We have a series of blogs in the show notes. Also, you can visit the merch store. At the very least, like and subscribe and register your comments below. Okay, take care.